Er, earlier also, there was a conversation, and actually it was yesterday, uh, that, that I was going back and forth on social media. Uh, and there were some folks who were talking about, you know, that Black-owned media really needs to be, you know, covering this story needs to be all over it. And, and I said something to them that I said, actually, what you're describing is very difficult to do. Here's what I mean. People are always saying what black-owned media should and should be doing, but a lot of people don't even understand the nature of the business. The fact of the matter is, you don't necessarily have a lot of top reporters at many of the black-owned media outlets because we're not bringing in the money to be able to hire them. You can run it down, Ebony, Essence, Black Enterprise, Blavity, I can go on and on and on. You don't have significant reporting staff. What you do see out there are people who are writing these stories uh, and they're just aggregating content. And I, as I keep saying that the problem with aggregating content is that when you do that, you also then begin to push out false information. So, perfect example. Somebody said to me, well, you know, look at Essence, they did a story. Okay, and this is not to pick on Essence and pick on this particular reporter, but it's a problem. So if you look at the story that was posted on Essence, Sean Diddy Combs, Holmes raided in connection with federal sex trafficking investigation. In investigators have interviewed numerous accusers in connection with accusations of assault, trafficking, and the distribution and solicitation of narcotics and firearms, sources say. Okay, got it. So when you now read the story, it is by a Revea Ruff, and I don't know who that person is, uh, if they're male or female, but I wanna walk y'all through why this, these type of stories are pro problematic. So when you go through the story, you see how they're quoting Fox 11 Los Angeles, okay, describing the raid on the home. And then you see them saying that uh, two of Combs' sons have been handcuffed. Then they go, it says, but handcuffed and detained by authorities during the search, but these reports have, yet, have not yet been confirmed. Well, why are you reporting it? Then when you go through the story, they're quoting the, uh, they're quoting the Homeland Security saying, uh, Homeland Security describing what took place. It says the federal department said in a statement released to news outlets. Okay, well, I don't understand why Essence didn't get a copy of the statement, so they don't have to attribute it to news outlets. And so then when you go through here, it says via CNBC, a source with knowledge of the situation reported that federal authorities have interviewed three women and one man in New York regarding allegations of sexual assault, sex trafficking, interviews with three more women are forthcoming. Here's a problem with that. That's not your source. So what you're doing as Essence, you're putting a stamp of approval on a source from CNBC who you don't know. You don't actually know if this is true. The point here is y'all, I'm not defending Diddy. I'm showing y'all the problem when black owned media takes and aggregates content from other sources that you are not familiar with. So to quote a source from CNBC, when typically in media, you want to have two sources that confirm information. The information that I reported to you about the sale of Revolt, I got from four sources, four, not one, not two, not three, four. So then when you go through this story, you sit here again, you see them talking about the Cassie lawsuit, blah, 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 the lawsuit. Then this is the problem for me. You see, they quote, the attorney for Cassie, he said in a statement via CNBC, and that's it. Nowhere in this story, nowhere in this story do you see anywhere where it says so-and-so told Essence. Nowhere in this story do you see Essence call Diddy or reach out to Diddy and his representatives to get comment on the story. Yesterday, when the raid took place, yesterday, when the raid took place, again, we're following, uh, uh, we're following the story. Hmm, what's my first instinct? 
called Diddy. 7.32 p.m. Eastern yesterday, this text message, because there are all these reports saying he's flying to Bermuda. Are you in Bermuda or the United States? Any comment on Homeland Security raiding your homes? I'm live on my show. That's journalism. And so the problem that I have is that what we are seeing right now, we are seeing black-owned media and other folks run with any story, no vetting, no fact-checking, no determination if it's true or not. So this is why it is a danger for black-owned media to aggregate content. What happened to picking the phone up yourself? What happened to calling yourself? We should not be slapping our bylines on stories when all we're doing is rewriting somebody else's work. This is not the first time that I've called out black owned media and black targeted media for aggregating content. I've called out The Root, NBC News, Blavity, News One, Black Enterprise, and others before. And so what I need people to understand is when you're out talking about what black owned media should be covering, you should then be asking, do we have the resources to actually do that? Are we using freelance writers or do we actually have staff writers? And the fact of the matter is, you do not have the reporting chops in most black owned media places that you're used to. Urban One is the largest black owned media company, the largest. They own 50 plus radio stations, TV One, My Clio, they own Interactive One. And I can tell you right now, very little news, very little reporters. And let me be clear, this is nothing against young journalists, but having somebody young being paid $35,000, $40,000 rewriting articles, that is not reporting. That is not journalism. Black people are not served when this happens. So here's the problem when Essence does this, or The Root, or The Grio, or anybody, is when you rewrite a story and stick your byline on it, you're giving the black-owned media stamp of approval to everything in the article. So black folks then read the article and go, oh, gotta be true. And they run with it. If you don't believe me, all you have to do is look at today and look at how many people ran with the story of, um, of revolt being sold. Numerous folks ran with that story. It's not true. So when you do that, so here you go. Hollywood Unlocked. Diddy has reportedly sold revolt to TV to an anonymous buyer. Network is still black owned. And what are they doing? They're, they're quoting TMZ. Stamp of approval. That story, I'm telling y'all, is factually wrong. Same thing. If I go over here to, let's see here. I'm gonna pull up um, another outlet. I'm checking to see, uh, checking to see uh, if they ran with this story. Uh, boom, shade room. They're quoting Philip Lewis, a journalist who's quoting TMZ. Same thing. Oh, quoting them. And I get it. The story's wrong. But look at this here. 65, I'm going to show you. 65,000 likes, 5,883 comments on the story. That's what you see right there. I didn't show you that for Hollywood Unlocked for their story. Let me pull that back up. Their story, 735 comments, uh, 4,378 likes. Okay, so that's their story. So if I go over here to, let me see here. If I go over to, give me one second, I'm double checking. Hold on, hold on. So Jasmine Brand, know them well. They post the story, it's the end of an era. According to a report from TMZ, Diddy is no longer associated with Revolt. 6,775 likes. Again, 
uh, 17 comments on here, okay? Quoting them. All right, I'm gonna do one more, do one more. And the reason I'm going through this is because I'm trying to show y'all what happens when stuff is reported and then it's passed on uh, through black owned media and people see it and they go, oh, it was in the shade room. Oh, it was in this. Well, perfect example, baller alert, the same thing. Headline, Revolt TV has a new owner. Diddy sells all shares. Read more, ballalert.com. It's wrong. All because they're quoting TMZ. TMZ is not always correct. And so black owned media, pick up the damn phone and call somebody. Actually verify, check something. Not a single person here would like for somebody to do a story reporting erroneous information. And so we've got to understand that black owned media owes it to black people to not just report anything white media reports. Perfect example, before I go to my panel on this. The Washington Post did a story that essentially said that Tamika Mallory, Carmen Perez, Bob Bland, and Linda Sarsour had been run out of the Women's March. It wasn't the case. They were term limited. They couldn't run again. They didn't get voted out. They didn't resign. They were term limited. But guess what happened? News1.com, Blavity, picked the story up. I saw it and I called both of them saying, take that shit down. It's wrong. How can you be a black owned outlet and you don't try to call Tamika or Carmen or Bob or Linda? I remember the Washington Free Beacon wrote a story about Biden administration hand out crack pipes. It was a BS story. Black Enterprise rewrote it. I email the ownership and the editorial leadership of Black Enterprise saying, your story is wrong. Why are you rewriting a BS story from a conservative outlet which was designed to actually cause misinformation? And lastly, and I'm walking y'all through this, when the Associated Press reported that the Biden administration cut funding to HBCUs by 35 billion, Newsweek picked the story up, blew it up on their cover. Black people, activists, and all kinds of different people, and I'll say it, I remember Jamal Bryant, Tamika Mallory, both had posted it on their socials. Hey, take that shit down, it's wrong. I said, they got it wrong. We cover this, so you know what happened? I knew the story. When, first of all, when Biden was running, he said the amount of money they wanted to give to black and Hispanic serving institutions. I want y'all to understand how misinformation works. So then when AP writes the story and Newsweek writes the story, they say the cuts to HBCU funding. Black folks lost their minds. First of all, he pledged the money to black and Hispanic serving institutions. Well, guess what? When he introduced the first bill, it was a $10 trillion bill. The full $35 billion was in the bill. Congress then was like, yeah, we ain't spending $10 trillion. So it got cut to $5 trillion. Then it got cut to $3 trillion. Then $2.5 trillion. Then the $1.5 trillion. Then Manchin and others said that's still too much money. So when they say Biden cut it, no, he proposed it. Congress is like, we ain't passing a $10 trillion bill. I dare any of y'all to Google it right now, you'll see it. So if you initially propose the bill at 10 trillion and the Congress says now nah, we ain't going for it and it get cut to 1.5 trillion, that means 8.5 trillion got cut. It stands to reason that the HBCU and Hispanic Service Institution money is gonna get cut. But guess what happened? The Newsweek story went everywhere. And we spent three weeks breaking the story down, showing you why it was factually wrong. 
This is the mistake that black owned media cannot make. We cannot report news. I don't care if it's Diddy. I don't care if it's Jay-Z. I don't care if it's about HBCUs. I don't care if it's about Vice President Kamala Harris. We owe it to black people. And we owe it to all those black people that are on my wall in there that started black owned media. We owe it to Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells Barnett and Robert Abbott and A.I. Scott and Charlotta Bass and John H. Johnson and Chuck Stone and, and, uh, and, uh, and again, Ethel Payne and Alice Dunnigan and Louis Martin and Earl Graves and Ed Lewis and on and on and on to get it right for our people. We cannot be repeating what white media says and take it as fact. Because when we do, we're doing a disservice to our people. Go to my panel, I'm gonna stop for you first. Yeah, you know, we just gotta be very careful that we create this fertile ground for disinformation and misinformation. Um, because when we do, you know, we, we do it to the own detriment of our own people. We know that many folks in the media world uh, focus on the sensationalism. And, well, you know, many folks will do anything for likes and retweets and all these other types of things, even sharing information that they know is false or that they haven't verified. So we just have to be very careful, especially in the time we're living in, because there are those individuals who will feed that misinformation so that it continue to, to uh, deconstruct our communities, both our trust uh, and the, the set of actions that we need to be able to move forward in a positive direction. John Quell. You know, to add to what was just said, you know, it's interesting that with all of the blogs and a lot of the black owned media, not only is it just about the likes and the comments, but it's also just about who can get the most followers, um, and also, you know, just wanting to report the scandalous nature of something, even if something if we can get back to reporting what it, what are the actual facts <laughs> that are going on and not trying to sensationalize or scandalize um, everything. And furthermore, that goes back to Cardi B, right, where she had to sue um, Tasha K. I believe that's her name. Yep. Um, and she sued her for defamation. And won four and won four million dollars. Yeah, and won. Yeah, hey, I think it was like four million dollars. And and then after that, um, and then who followed suit behind her was um, the comedian Kevin Hart. He then sued her. So also, not only do we need to be careful to um, report facts, facts, right, and to protect our community, right, because media is the most one of the most powerful tools that exists. It shapes the entire world's perce yeah. perception of us and our community. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was $3.4 million, not, um, not $4 million. Go ahead. And furthermore, um, when you, when black owned media, when you are calling to get the facts of, of, of our own stories, don't try to extort the individuals either because then that precipitated Kevin Hart then suing her because he was given um, some demands that if he didn't pay a certain amount that this story was gonna air. So don't, so don't do that either, right? But, uh, <laughs> so uh, it, uh, you, know, you know, all I want, and, and, and again, it, and, and, when I, and when I did last night, what I did last night that I was trying to walk people through, because it was hard for a lot of people to understand it. I was, I was, and also today, I was trying to walk them through the economic reality. I was trying to walk them through what happens economically. I was trying to explain to them when Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Orton had the General Accounting Office do a uh, report over a five-year period, the federal government spent $5 billion on advertising. In that five-year period, black-owned media got 51 million of the five, bill, five billion. Let me slow that down. I need everybody to understand. Over five years, 2012, 2017, I need everybody to understand. Here's the deal, Gavin. Uh -uh. Gavin, five billion dollars was spent on advertising by the federal government. Black-owned media got 51 million out of the five. All black-owned media combined. As everybody got 51 million out of the five billion. 
Congressman Joyce Beatty, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty came to me and she said, you know, uh, we come out of our CBC meeting, uh, there's nobody in the black press out there. I said, Congresswoman, we can't afford to pay somebody seventy-five dollars to $100,000 to cover Congress. I said, but if a billion dollars is spent every year with black-owned media, and black-owned media got 10% of that money, that's $100 million. Let's say, let's say we got 2% of the 10%, let's just say 2% of the 100 million. It's $2 million. I've said it. With the recent layoffs of BuzzFeed News, of The Messenger, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, Vice, I could hire a newsroom staff, I need everybody listening, with that 2 million, I could hire a newsroom staff of 10 top-notch reporters that would be the baddest black news staff in America. If just us, if we only got two million of the hundred million. In the business, $340 billion is spent, was spent last year. Today, in New York, last two days, yesterday, today, tomorrow, Magna, major ad agency, they're having their upfronts. Supposed to be their diversity upfronts. Now let me explain. We kicked the thing off with a black-owned collective. Then they went from black-owned media to diverse-owned media. So now everybody up there presenting. We were told that, oh no, they're not going to be presentations. It's going to be these panel conversations. My guys at Urban Edge Network there is presentations. Were we invited to present? Nope. We weren't. Who controls the money? The agencies do. 24 years ago, BET was sold, Gavin, for $2.4 billion, the assumption of $400 million in debt, for $2.8 billion. Black-owned media was getting 1% of all ad money in, 2000, in the year 2000. 24 years later, it's 1%. So what I say to black people, if we're going to be sitting here talking about what black-owned media should be covering, then we need black people saying, let's fight for the money. Let's challenge these companies when it comes to the money. Let's challenge Magna and every single company that they represent to ensure that they are providing funds and advertising dollars to black-owned media. This, Gavin, is why we can't hire staff. It's because we are not getting the resources that white media is getting, and we're making do by rewriting other people's stuff. Yeah, and Roland, it's really hard to follow what you just laid out and what um, Mustafa and John Quell uh, added. I want to first thank you, Roland, for clearing all this up through your commitment to journalistic excellence. You had a lawyer on last night when you were breaking down this story. And I was watching this segment, and while a whole host of other news outlets were reporting the salacious rumors and jumping to conclusions about what the raids yesterday may have entailed, you and, and your guest you know, were very clear in conveying to all of your viewers that we should not, that we could not jump to conclusions, that it was imperative for us to listen to the authorities, for us to you know, not conclude anything other than what they had said, and so I want to thank you for doing that. I want to thank you for refocusing this conversation to where I think it ought to be, right, which is on the money, on the resources. And there's such clear parallels, too, to the conversation we were having earlier, to the conversation you had last week, the ongoing conversation about the underinvestment in HBCUs, right? Yep, yep. And, and so I think it's, on, it's important for us to understand the ways in which all Black institutions remain underinvested, and it's intentional. Um, and I'm really tired of, you know, our community always sort of being last on the, you know, the order of, of funding. I think it's a call to action. It should be a call to action. I think we're going to be talking to an entrepreneur later tonight uh, who's launched a, um, a, a toy business right in the Midwest. And so I think it should be a call to action even for, you know, for us and our community to remember we got to start businesses so that we can go to black owned media 
and we can pay for advertising because we're not just going to be able to rely on, you know, the goodwill or good nature <laughs> of those outside of our community. So I think it's important for us to remember that, too. Um, but, you know, when it comes to this, when it comes to HBCUs, when it comes to so many other black institutions, I'm just tired of this underinvestment. Um, and that's me sitting here saying this for you, Roland. I cannot imagine the, the you know, what you have overcome in building out your platform. And I want to just thank you for giving us this space to talk about this issue and so many other critical ones that other outlets are not covering. And it goes back to what uh, John Quell and Mustafa were saying, which is we live in this 24 hour news cycle. We live in a culture in which collectively we all just kind of don't want to read. Right. We see these snippets on social media. We hear these sound bites. The media latches onto that sensationalism. And as a community, we have come to distrust, right, the mainstream media in a lot of ways. And so <laughs> yep. we then turn to the black media and we have such trust in black media. Again, same can be said about our black institutions, HBCUs, black doctors, right, all of these different institutions. And so, as you said, right, black media owes it to our community to make sure that we don't cut corners when it comes to our journalistic standards. But of course, like you said, this all comes down to the money. And, uh, and I'm tired of our community settling for scraps. Well, I, I just, the, the, the thing for me, and I'm, I'm going to show y'all something in a second. The thing for me, Mustafa, that, again, and, and I take this personal, is that we have to understand when we post it, when we post it, when we post it, people believe it. So you got to be careful reposting something that, or put or putting your bylaw on and re you know aggregating and putting it up in the Washington Post. I don't care for the Washington Post or the New York Times or Wall Street Journal. They can get it wrong too. And that's the point. People are trusting us. And so it's this is not about, oh hey, my sources got me the information about the seller revolt, but it's a perfect example. What is being reported is wrong. The sale is not final. It's wrong. Facts matter. We, as you said, we are trusted voices. We are ambassadors in many instances to our communities. And of course, others are as well. And, and when we don't live up to the hashtag black excellence, then we're doing a disservice to our people. We're doing a disservice to our community. And we are allowing those who would continue to try and deconstruct our communities, to dismantle our communities, uh, and to make sure that our communities are not moving forward in, in a, a direction that is going to be helpful, we're, we're helping them to be able to achieve their aims and their goals. So we have to check everyone. We got to double, triple check, um, you know, the information, but we also got to be mindful of how we're sharing that information uh, and how it will have impacts inside of our community. So we have a lot of work to do, and I hope that folks um, as was shared before, actually start to read. I know you're tired. I know you're trying to put food on the table and keep the lights on, but we've got to make sure we're doing our own due diligence to make sure that what is being injected into our communities is something that is helpful and not something that will continue to hold us back. Uh, final point uh, on this that I need to address right now, and you heard me say it earlier, that Magna Global um, is, they may be having their equity um, or inclusion upfronts. Now, when we started this thing, when we started this thing, this black owned media collective, we were very clear. We were talking black. We were not talking everybody. But what you've seen is you've seen how this thing has all oh, morphed into, oh, no, it's 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 equity. It's everyone. It's everyone. In fact, I, I'm sitting here. I'm, I'm going through emails right now and, and, and I'm looking when we first started uh, this, and I'm looking at emails going back to 2021, uh, when they had uh, their media day, um, and their, their, you know, and so it was like, hmm, their media equity up front. 2021, do y'all realize that it'll be three years? It'll be three years in, um, March or May, we haven't gotten a single dime from a Magna Global client. But what I, I want to show y'all what happens when we focus on black owned and then how they try to shift it to put everybody in the same category. 
This is the video on Magna Global's Instagram page right now. Watch this. y'all didn't miss that. Did, did y'all see the key thing right there? I'm going to play it again just to make sure that y'all didn't miss it. And, and I'm going to go down my panel and see if each one of them caught what I caught. So let me play this again for y'all. What did you see, uh, Jonquil? Well, I can tell you that it is not a Black-owned collective at all anymore, right? So they said that it started with that being the idea, and essentially it's using the word equity and inclusiveness to essentially show that that it's open to all uh, companies that need their resources. So there's no um, distinction mm -hmm. um, in s between the... Um, different companies anymore. So which, which once was for African-American publishers, right. um, it's, that's no longer the case. Gavin, what did you see? Well, I noticed that they had a long laundry list of everyone else and then put black last. I noticed that. Um, I also noticed, to me, I would summarize it in one word, performative. I noticed how they had the videos and the pictures of our people scattered throughout. And um, performative is, is, is what I would reduce it down to. But I was very, I was, what I noticed was that they listed a bunch of other groups and put us dead last. Mustafa. All you have to do is look at the beginning when they said the best black, uh, black publishers. I don't know if it said black owned publishers. So that gave you the idea that everything you're about to see is going to be representative of folks who come from that group. Um, what I saw was the same thing that's happened with the civil rights movement, where we do the work and then others are actually are the ones who get the benefit from it. All three of you are correct. That is exactly uh, what I saw as well. So you say it started with black, but then you show everybody and you got black last. So we carry all that water. But here's the question I would love for Magna Global to answer. What is the percentage, and again, for everybody else, that's fine. All the rest of the folks that were mentioned, the other groups, that is not my concern. What I wanna know, Magna Global, what is your black number? What is the percentage of your contracts that black-owned media is receiving? I don't wanna talk black targeted. I wanna hear black-owned. Now, on their channel, Instagram, they have a, Spotlight on Urban One, a uh, black-owned media company, used to work for them, TV One, Tom, they own Reach Media, Reach Media, Tom Jonas' company, so they all work for them. But my problem is when I see these equity upfronts from these agencies where we spend money, go to New York, present in front of them, but what money actually comes back? I can tell everybody watching right now, everybody who's watching, in three years, Black Star Network has got nothing from Magna. Oh, we put together PowerPoint presentations. We participated in the equity upfront in 2021. Wasn't invited in 2022. Wasn't invited in 2023. My guys at Urban Edge Network, did they present? Yep, they presented the last three years. How much did they get back? Nothing. So who's actually benefiting from these equity upfronts? I need Magna Global to tell me, what's your number? 
are the companies that you represent. And tomorrow, tomorrow's show, I'm going to list those companies. Because here's the problem, y'all. These ad agencies are representing billions of dollars from these companies and it's performative what they're doing. Oh, a few black people may be getting some money and a little bit others, but no, 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 no. We gotta go beyond a few. So I'm showcasing this to everybody who's watching so y'all now understand this right here is why we can't hire staffers. This right here is why we can't hire reporters. This right here is why we don't have more producers because we're being frozen out of this and there is the veneer of inclusivity. How are we the equity up front? Okay, we know in the business, 80% of all, ad, I need, this is the last point before I gotta go to break. Y'all, 80% of all advertising money is allocated during the upfronts, which are happening right now. They happen in April, they happen in March, April, May. They're happening right now. Then they have what is called a scatter market. Or you have a, actually you have three. This is upfronts. You have a secondary market in September, but then you have the scatter market. You know what scatter market is? November, December. Hey, we got some money left over. Hey, can we throw something at you? Mm -hmm. Do you know where most of the money that we've gotten from ad agencies came from? Scatter. They call us, they call Urban Edge Network in November and December. Hey, can, what, what, what can you do for 75,000, for 100,000? Now they gave out $7 million earlier, but here's the scatter money. That's where black owned media largely gets money in the scatter market. We don't get the money allocated up front. So now I hope people understand when you're like, why aren't we seeing black owned media do this, do that? If you ain't got access to the dollars, you cannot hire the people. And so it doesn't cost me anything. You know what? And, and last point, last year, you know what Magna Global did? Magna Global invited Carlos Watson of Ozzy to present. He was already under investigation by the feds. Two weeks after he presented at Magna upfront, he got indicted. We weren't even invited. And our numbers are real. We now know that his numbers are fabricated. But see, what they do is they pick and choose who they want to invite. And maybe they say, oh, he too noisy, he too loud. Well, guess what? I ain't got nothing to lose. So I'm going to stay noisy and stay loud. And Magna Global, I'm tired of sending emails. I'm tired of having fake meetings. The question is, when are we going to see business? And until we do, I'm gonna keep calling you out. And next, I'm gonna start naming all of the companies you represent and I'm gonna show their logos. So our audience knows who we are giving our money to, who ain't sending money back to us.